so I didn't post anything from the last lecture yet. Um, there's a section of it that was good, and then it just went, something went off haywire. So I, I was reevaluating it, and maybe today I'll publish the part that's good, but it's only about a fourth of it that was good. Okay? But I do have them from last year. So uh, please take a look at those. Well, where are we at today? We're still in the Bernoulli's equation. Last time we talked about the Torricelli, and uh, that predicts basically the flow rate um, out of a small hole or a crack or just an opening from a fluid in a tank, a large tank. And that's really a subset of uh, Bernoulli's equation, although Torricelli developed it before Bernoulli was around to develop his equation. We also talked about siphoning. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the pitot-static tube and the Venturi flow meter kinetic kinetic energy correction factor where we want to apply Bernoulli's to a tube of fluid but the tube of fluid isn't all at the same speed. It, it has a varying pro velocity profile in the tube. So there's a kinetic energy correction factor alpha but I'm just going to let you know most of the time you just set alpha to 1 and there's really no correction factor. But sometimes you'll see this alpha show up in Bernoulli's equation. You say, what is that alpha? Well, if you want to get really precise, uh, it would be something other than 1 depending on the velocity profile inside that duct or tube. And then we modify Bernoulli's. So we have the unmodified Bernoulli. It is energies conserved. Then we have a modified Bernoulli where we say, no, there's some losses. There's some losses. What's lost? Well, the head is, some head is lost. Where does it go? Uh, and through viscous dissipation out of the mechanical energy balance equation, but it's still energy, but it's just making things warmer. Friction. If you're going to have some loss due to friction, flow in a pipe, then maybe some gain. Maybe you have a pump to increase the head, why not include that in a, in a modified Bernoulli? And you can do that. And that's pretty much the chapter. So let's jump into it. So here this person, Henry Pito. Pito, let's see, where did he live? He was a French uh, hydraulic engineer. And he uh, developed a tube. And it's named after him, the Pito tube. And it's used to measure the velocity of a flowing fluid. And uh, it looks like he was assigned the task of measuring the flow rate in the river. And he went out and devised this instrument to do it. Uh, what are the years that he lived and when did he die? He died at 76. That sounds good to me. A little older instead of younger. And in my hand right here is a pitot tube that I'm going to pass around. Um, if you, this one is to measure airflow in large ducts. So uh, when this building or the next building or whatever buildings on campus have been built, they had a phase at the end of the construction called commissioning. And they went out and they basically, or uh, the, the different names, but sometimes they call it commissioning, making sure that the thing is operating. Before they give the keys to the new owner, here are your keys, you know, UTSA, congratulations on spending $100 million. And you're now the proud owner of a new building. You want to test it every now and then to see if it works. And they'll come in with instruments like this, and they'll pop a hole in the duct, slide that in, and put it at different uh, locations inside the duct, aligned with the flow direction, and they'll be able to measure the airflow. The, the, the velocity at that location, that location, that location, depending on what type of duct it is, you can get a lot of measurements at different cross-sectional locations in the profile and make uh, accurate assessment of the uh, airflow. Here are two ports to hook up, little tubes. These typically they'll go to a digital uh, manometer, but you could have had an old-fashioned water-filled manometer. It would work just the same. So come out, go in a dip, come back up, come to the other side, put water in it, no flow, balanced on both sides. You have it lined, there's flow, there's going to be a difference in the measurements. And so this is the tube. Let me show you an illustration of a tube. 
There's three versions of the tube, the pitot tube. The one that's most common is the pitot static tube, meaning you're taking two pressure measurements with one instrument, and it's really the difference in the two pressure measurements. So here's the pitot static tube. You have flow coming this way, and it'll hit the tip of this tube right here. It won't go into the tube. The f there's no airflow through the tube, but the fluid comes to rest s before it then goes around the edges of the <coughs> tube. That point is called a, what type of point? If the fluid comes to rest at that point, what's true about the, f uh, usually air, think of air. So what's, what's something about that point? It comes to rest, it's the stag stagnation it's stagnant right there it's not moving it's a stagnation point and the pressure here though will be high at that stagnation point okay now uh, when it flows around the tube then it's coming along the sides of the tube again and the tube isn't very large in diameter you like them very narrow uh, especially in, in, uh, in comparison to the diameter of the tube that you're measuring the airflow. So it's really not pinching the airflow in the large duct. You know, it's not really blocking the airflow in the large duct. Do you see that? But um, back away from the tip, there will be some ports, and I'm going to pass this around. What is this one? This is about uh, two and a half inches back from the tip, okay? And there's ports that go all the way around. There's one, two, looks like there's eight ports here, little holes. And there's no airflow in or out of those holes, just like there's no airflow in or out of the hole at the tip. But it, it's able to sense the pressure there. Okay? So what they're showing you is little holes right along here. Usually there's only one ring of holes just going around every uh, 45 degrees or something like that, or even every 90 degrees, there'd be four holes in. But at this one, it looks like it's every 45 degrees. And uh, that is connected through an air passage to an other side of a manometer. So this passage here at the tip to stagnation points connected to one side of the manometer. The holes on the side are connected to the other side of the manometer. And when there's flowing fluid going this way, which pressure is going to be higher? The one at the stagnation point in the middle or on the edges of the back a little bit? You could tell from this illustration which one is higher. The one in the middle, the stagnation point. And by reading this H, Inferring this delta P, you can infer the V. You can, you can detect how, how fast it's going. Because it's related to the pressure. Yep, because you make a pressure measurement. So let me pass this around. Here you go. You want to? Is the, is the stagnation point equal to the weight of the fluid or the weight of the column of fluid? Well, that's a, uh, sometimes what we have is we have two fluids that we're talking about. We're talking about the density of the flowing fluid and then the density of the fluid in the manometer, okay? And sometimes we can get those confused. Uh, maybe for the first thing you think about is air is the flowing fluid, like that pitot tube that I'm passing around is really for air measurements. You could use it for water measurements, but it's really for air measurements. And you probably want something like uh, mercury in your manometer or something dense, heavy in your manometer. If you're using it for water flow, you better have something denser than water. Okay. Well, let's do this. Uh, let's do this. Let's go ahead and assume something like this is for air. So what do we do is we p put a, a Bernoulli's equation applied to a streamline going from here to here, from point one to point two. What is the equation? The pressure 1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared is equal to the pressure at 2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared. Which of the four terms is 0? Which of the four terms is 0 in this equation as I've written it? 
Where is point two? What's the name of point two? Stagnation, Stagnation point. So which of the, the velocity is zero, hence the kinetic energy is zero. So this is zero at the stagnation point. And we said that P2 is greater than P1. Well, now we know how much greater it is. P2 minus P1, that's that pressure difference, is equal to 1 half rho V1 squared. That's that free stream, upstream velocity. Well, then they say, well, how am I going to measure P1? Well, basically the pressure far away, if, far away from the probe the tip of the tube, the pressure is not changing as it's flowing the next three inches down the tube. So the pressure at every cross section is essentially the same. Now in this zone right around the tip, things change because the fluid's coming to rest, it's decelerating, then it, as it goes around the sides, it's accelerating. So don't make a measurement around there, make a measurement at the tip to get the stagnation pressure but come back on the side right here a little bit back from the tip and now you can get the static pressure. That's why they call it the pedostatic tube. You're making both, both a measurement at the tip and the stagnation, or not the stagnation, the static pressure inside the duct. So what do the side ports allow you to do? They allow you to measure either P2 or P1 or V1, which, which, which do they allow you to measure? They're ma allowing you to measure that, f that P1. What, what's the name of P1? It would be the static pressure inside the duct or pipe or something. So, so this side comes, and now what does the manometer give you? The manometer gives you the delta P measurement. Right? So if I wanted to know, to infer the speed of the fluid, it would be 2 times delta P divided by rho square root. Does that make sense? So, so here showing this in illustration. Most of them are pedostatic tubes. Measuring off the tip, it would be a, just a simple pedo tube. Measuring off the side, you're getting the static pressure in the vicinity of the tube. Take the difference, you have the pedostatic tube. The pressure difference, you infer the, the fluid velocity. Let's say you're using a manometer. What is that delta P equal to? Isn't it rho of the fluid in the manometer times G times the height difference in the manometer? So you could re-express this, V sub 1 is equal to the square root of 2, rho g h over rho. Hey, let's cancel these rows. Good idea? Nope. One of them is the rho that's used in the manometer to give the rho g h. That would be the manometer fluid, maybe mercury. <laughs> One is the row of the fluid that's coming to rest at the tip of that tube. That's the air, maybe, or the water that's flowing. So don't just cancel those rows. Uh, they're different. They're different fluids. Remember this row right here? Isn't that the row of the air, the flowing fluid? And the row right here is the mercury in the manometer. Okay. So there's the, the um, pedostatic tube. And hopefully you have some experience in your labs uh, when you're taking ME lab uh, using that device and making some measurements. Water flows in a 20 centimeter diameter pipe at <coughs> 8 meters per second. Have I encouraged you to organize the information given in a problem as you're trying to read it, decipher what you're being asked for? You know, so. Make a little sketch. There is a pipe. Talk about the diameter of the pipe, 20 centimeters. And the velocity is V8 meters per second. It has a static pressure of 80 kilopa. First time you have to understand, well, what is that static pressure? It's the pressure that's not the velocity pressure. 
you, you have from Bernoulli's, you have P plus one half rho V squared plus, let's leave out rho G Z right here, but this is the velocity pressure, or they call it sometimes the dynamic pressure. It would be the pressure if I took that flow, flowing at that speed, and brought it to rest. That's the increase in pressure at that stagnation point. Increase in what? Over the static pressure. Static pressure. So like if you close the vent on your air conditioner, the pressure on the vent might be closer. Yep, go up. Here, if I had a nice little port on the side of that duct, and I was able to accurately measure the pressure on the side of the duct. The flow is just slim, uh, skimming along, right? It's, it, there's no little bump or eddy or, or disturbance right there where I'm making the port. It's nice and smooth. I'm getting a nice smooth wall pressure measurement. That's my static pressure. But if I came out here and put something that stopped it right there, now I don't want to stop the whole thing, but I just want to stop part of it. Well, the flow pressure right there is going to be higher. It'll be the static pressure plus the velocity pressure because it's all coming to rest. And a smaller cross-sectional area. Yeah, you want a small cross-sectional area. You don't want to choke the whole thing. Right. Uh, because if I'm blocking it a little bit, maybe I should have put the blockage right by it right here. If I'm blocking it just a little bit, this pressure won't measure, that measurement on the wall won't change. It's just in this vicinity of the blockage that there's a pressure variation in the flow field. The pressure is not constant in the flow field. But it builds up right there by how much? The velocity pressure or the dynamic pressure. Different names. Different names, okay? And this is your hydrostatic pressure. That's the component in the Bernoulli. But here we're uh, we're just using it for uh, horizontal flow in a pipe. And, oh, look at even the wording. Measured at the side wall. That's how the static pressure would typically be measured, at the side wall. What is the pressure measured by a pitot tube placed in the middle of the pipe? Here, if you just put a pitot tube that blocks it, and now you just were able to somehow, I'm going to just, illustrate it like this, put a pressure measurement right there. It's going to sense both the static plus the velocity pressure, so this is what it's going to measure. So it's going to measure the 80 kilopascal plus the one half, what, what is flowing, water or air? Water, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed for the density. What is the velocity? 8 meters per second. And at this point, you know you need to be very cautious about making sure the units work. So what unit would we like to introduce? Well, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So anybody have a calculator? <coughs> and can you tell me what the pressure that will be sensed by the pitot tube in the middle of the pipe? Well, I forgot this, right? It's V squared. Let me do this. What's 8 squared? 64. Divide it by 2. 32, right? Then I multiply it by 1,000. Do I have 80 plus 32,000? Or not? No, something's wrong. What the, what's wrong? Yeah, look at that's a kilo instead of the, in front of the Pascal. And so I have to put a, a kilo is a thousand. Put that in just like a unit conversion. And now I can work with the Pascal is a newton per meter squared. And let's be really careful. Thousands go. I'm going to be left with the kilo. That's going to stay there. 
it's going to be multiplying the Pascal. But the Newtons go, kilograms go, I get uh, meters to the fourth, and I have meter cubed times meters, so the meters go. And then I have uh, second squared here and second squared there. I'm left with kilopascal, but a common mistake might be a thousand. So it's not 32,000, it's 32. So what is the final answer? So what is 8 times 8? 64. Divide by 2, that's 32. 32 plus 80. What do you, it's a 112 kilopascal. Make sense? Ready to go on? Somebody else, Venturi. You'll hear about the pitot tube. You'll hear about the pitot-static tube. Sometimes people will say a pitot tube when they really mean what I've just passed around, a pitot-static tube. But just the general term pitot, pitot tube. You know, Bernoulli's equation, Torricelli's equation. But now we talk about Venturi. And you can talk about a Venturi tube, a Venturi flow meter, a Venturi pump. They're all after this person right here, uh, Giovanni Venturi. You can see the years that he lived. And uh, basically, what, what nationality is he? Italian. Italian. How old was he when he died? Pretty old, had a great life, and did a lot. Okay. Oh, I forgot. There was one of these words. Because of this discovery, he is the what? Of the Venturi tube, the Venturi flow meter, the what? How many people have seen that word before? There you go. See, you can learn from Wikipedia. <laughs> so, eponym. And now you just go to the online dictionary to look up words. And if you don't know how to pronounce it, you hit the button and you can actually have some voice telling you, right? This is the correct, one correct way of pronouncing the word. And uh, so it basically is the person after whom a discovery, invention, place, etc. is named or thought to be named. That's why it's, so it's the meter, flow meter, the Venturi flow meter. And so kind of neat. So what is that Venturi effect that gives us a rise to so many devices that have his name, like a Venturi flow meter? Well, the Venturi effect is reduction in the fluid pressure that results from the fluid flow through a reduction in cross-sectional area, a constriction. Okay, so here's an illustration. We have flow going in a tube. And what, what's different between this section right here, the area at one, and the area at two. The diameter went down, the cross-sectional area went down, and what has to happen? The speed has to go up. If the speed goes up, the pressure goes down. And so it's very interesting, first time you see this, most people would think that the pressure at one, the pressure at two, the pressure at two is greater than, but it's not. The pressure goes down, pressure at two is less than the pressure at one. So, um, let's go ahead and establish this by n using two facts. One is continuity, and one is co consideration of mechanical energy. Okay, so continuity equation, what does that tell us? Is that the flow going through one, let's say uh, rho A1, V1, isn't that the the flow rate through one is equal to rho A2 V2. Now you could do this for highly compressible flow, but we're not gonna do that for very compressible flow. We're gonna do it for essentially incompressible flow. And so right away, just consider rho constant, all right? Even if you have air, it may not have such a dramatic pressure and speed difference that it stays essentially incompressible. Okay, but if you start getting close to Mach 1, then all bets are off. You have to consider the compressible effects of air. But water, 
Water can go through here, no problem. Water flows in many Venturi flow meters. Okay, so that's continuity. What was continuity? Conservation of mass. It's a conservation of mass statement. Why do they say continuity? Historically, that's the way fluid mechanics and fluid dynamics speak. Okay. Then what about the energy? What do you mean by energy? I would say Bernoulli's equation. Apply Bernoulli's equation. It's the conservation of the mechanical energy of the flowing fluid. You have at point one, you have that you have the pressure at one plus one half rho v one squared is equal to the pressure at two plus one half rho v two squared. Uh, the density is the same, but you can't cancel it out of this equation. The density is going to stay in. You don't want to cancel out V1 or V2 because really what the Venturi flow meter allows you to do is to infer V1. So don't cancel it out. You can actually calculate V1. So let's go ahead and do that. What do we do is we say that... Um, that uh, V1 will be equal to uh, V2, put them squared, um, pl uh, plus um, 2 divided by rho P2 minus P1. Did I do the algebra correctly right there? Just changing the energy equation. Is that okay? Maybe I should do this, put a negative sign right there and put an equal sign. Is that still okay? Um, at this point, you may want to think, which, which speed is greater? Is V2 greater than V1? Sure, it's going to speed up as it goes through. So maybe I switch and put V2 squared minus V1 squared equal to 2 over rho P1 minus P2. Is, is, so is this term right here positive? And is this term positive as well? Yeah, both of those are positive, so it's probably the preferred form. All right. So if I wanted to calculate V1, I want an equation for V1, what could I do to get rid of this V2? I go back to the continuity equation. And for the continuity equation, isn't V2 equal to A1 divided by A2 times V1? Did you see what we did? So we're using both of them, both equations. And now you can get V1 squared times A1 over A2 quantity squared minus 1 equal to, then you, the, what's on the right-hand side. And then finally, I'm going to just try and fit it in right here. V1 is equal to the square root of 2 uh, P1 minus P2 divided by rho divided by um, A1 divided by A2 quantity squared minus 1. Does that look good? So somebody could use this device to actually come in and get the velocity measurement V1 down the pipe. The, they measure only, they only have to measure the the areas, they have to know the cross-sectional areas or the diameters to infer the areas and the area ratios, and then they measure the pressure difference. How do they measure that pressure difference? Well, probably put it up to a manometer, put the fluid at equal level in it, like that to start it with. The fluid starts to flow. As the fluid starts to flow, which way will the manometer shift? Will the fluid in the manometer shift that way? I should maybe change color. Will it shift that way so that it's higher and then lower? Or will the manometer shift this way, which would make it lower and higher? The second one? Does everybody agree? Sure. Because P1, I'm sorry, P2 is less than P1. So it would shift like, uh, oh, I raced too much. Sorry about that. So the manometer fluid would shift like that. 
And so you could measure this height difference in the shift of the manometer. And for the pressure difference, rho times g times h. Put that in here, two times that, divided by rho of the flowing fluid. And divide by this area term and take the square root, you get the velocity one. Isn't that neat? Yeah. So you can get a uh, um, measurement. Here's a question. I just established this equation, did I not? Didn't I establish the function as a function of P1, P2, rho, A1, and A2? Didn't I establish an expression for you to get V1? Here's another question. Give me the function for Q. What is Q? Volumetric flow rate. Volumetric flow rate. Like this had units for V1 of meters per second, volumetric flow rate flowing through the ductor pipe. What is that? Meter cubed per second, isn't it? I'm going to pause. I want you to do that for me, okay? I want you to give me the expression for Q. Is the Q equal to uh, A1 times V1? And this would be location one upstream, location two in the throat. Or it could be A2, V2. Yeah. And so we already, we just derived what was V2 and V1. I'm sorry. So you could get a nice expression for the volumetric flow rate, assuming rho is constant. And you'll see them here. I'm just copying out of a different source, Wikipedia page, I think, that you can get the flow rate as a function of A1 times, what do you think all of this is? V1. Or it could be A2 times all of this. What is that expression? V2. A2 times V2. So, all right. Air is flowing through a Venturi flow meter. The inlet diameter is 6 centimeters and the throat is three centimeters. The pressure measured at the inlet is 210 and 160 at the throat, kilopascal. The air density is 1.2. What is the flow rate of the air? What are they asking you to solve for? Q. What units? Meters cubed per second. What's the best number? A. Does A look better, best? Well, okay, well, I think it's A. So, but double check your calculations, especially your units. All right. Let's talk now about uh, kinetic energy correction factor. A lot of times you use Bernoulli not just along a line, but a line representing flow in a duct or a tube or a pipe. So there's something different now when you're saying, hey, this one line represents the flow in the whole pipe or the whole duct. So if you do that, let's say you have a pipe, and here's the Bernoulli equation going down the pipe, you would say, what at this location right here, one, I would have the static pressure one, I'd have the one-half rho V1 squared plus rho G Z1. Well, the static pressure typically doesn't change across the cross section, but the velocity could be high in the center and low at the edges. But what velocity would you like to use in this one half rho v squared? V1 A V G. What is that? The average. The average velocity. So what they said was, you can use the average velocity if you put an alpha in front of that one-half rho v squared. What is alpha? Alpha is a kinetic energy correction factor term. Here is the equation for alpha. Let's just look at that equation for a minute. What's the 1 over A, the integral dA, sound like? 
What does it look like? Forget about the Enneagram. It, it looks like something like the centroid or, or a weighted average, isn't it? Something like a weighted average. You're averaging something over that area. So now we peek inside. What are we averaging? Something to deal with the speed, the velocity. So U over U average cubed. That sure doesn't look like a simple expression, does it? Well, how did they get this simple expression for this alpha term, which is often close to unity when you have turbulent flow? And you can set up what it actually is when it's laminar flow and calculate it when it's laminar flow. Okay, it's most different, alpha is most different away from one when it's laminar flow. Because when it's laminar flow, the velocity profile is uh, quadratic, and so it's very fast in the middle compared to the edges. If it's turbulent flow, it's more like a plug flow. It's more uniform velocity profile over a larger section of the pipe. Okay? All right. But how do they get this funny expression? Well, what they say is they say, we're trying to get the flow of kinetic energy across the cross section. So you said, let's do this. Let's go back and get the mass flow rate. Let me introduce some symbols. The mass flow rate. Well, that would be the sum of all the little chunks of mass crossing the cross-sectional area. That would be rho times U times dA. So I move from a summation over the mass chunks to a summation over the cross-sectional area chunks. And isn't dM equal to rho U dA? And now I say, oh, I, if I'm giving u as a function of the location r, and I think about it going around rings of a, at, at location r going out, then I express dA as 2 pi r dr. So I got rho used as a function of r times 2 pi r dr. That's how you would get the mass flow rate. But you want a simple expression for the mass flow rate. The simple expression for the mass flow rate would be the rho times the average speed times the whole cross-sectional area, right? So you look at this equation and you say rho, the average speed area, is equal to the integral of rho u dA. I can get the equation for u average is equal to? 1 over A, taking care of that term, integral U dA, what did I cancel? Rows on both sides. You essentially assume it's not, the density is not a function of R in the cross section. So this is kind of, maybe you, you're speechless because it looks so simple. It's like, what? What did we just, did we just chase our tail? Did, is that what I just did? I, did I prove that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2? It's so easy. <laughs> but this is the same strategy that you have to do for the kinetic energy flow rate factor here. Okay. The kinetic energy flow rate is equal to what is 1 half U average squared? Isn't that the kinetic energy per unit mass? Then I multiply that by the mass flow rate down the tube. And I want to use the uh, correction factor alpha to make that equation work. So this is what I like to use, where this is alpha 1 half u average squared. What is mass flow rate? Rho u average a. So on the left-hand side, I have alpha 1 half U average cubed, uh, it doesn't matter where I put the row there. All right, how about on the right-hand side? Well, I want to have the one-half U squared, which is the local um, specific kinetic energy for each little chunk of mass, and I sum up over the whole cross-sectional area the flow rate, which is rho 
UDA. Integrate over the area. So it's the integral of one half rho u cubed dA, one half rho u cubed dA, where that u is a function of r. Let's go ahead and cancel the rows, cancel the halves. We find the equation alpha is equal to one over the area. I left off my integral, didn't I? Times the integral of u divided by u average cubed dA. And that's what we set out to demonstrate. If I want to calculate the value of alpha, I really need to know the velocity profile. And u is a function of r. We can get that in the next couple chapters, but the bottom line is there's really two cases. Is it laminar or turbulent? If it's laminar, it's quadratic, and U varies more dramatically than if it's turbulent. If it's turbulent, it, it's, it's pretty well flat over a large section of the pipe. So before we get to the most general modified Bernoulli, we say, well, we can have some head gain or some head loss for flow in a duct if it's air or tube or pipe. So if I have flow, I could have a pump. What's the pump doing? Well, I have a supply, W dot shaft, some shaft power. What's happening as a result of the pump being here from the inlet to the exit of the pump? It changes the pressure. Yeah, it does. And so that's the purpose of the pump. The pressure went up, P2 went up, and how is that realized in a Bernoulli? So you write a Bernoulli equation going through here, and you say that I have the inlet pressure plus one-half rho V1 squared plus rho GZ1 is equal to P2 plus one-half rho V2 squared plus rho GZ2. I didn't change the elevation. The cross-sectional area and the density of the fluid's the same, hence the flow rate's the same. I didn't change the speed. I didn't change the kinetic energy. What changed? We boosted the pressure. But to make the Bernoulli equation work, something has to be added to the Bernoulli equation. Here, we would add a pressure gain term. It's a pressure gain term due to what? The pump. Let's say you go down the pipe and uh, the, the pipe has a valve that's partially closed. Now we're talking about the inlet one to the pipe and the exit two of the pipe after the valve, in before the valve, after the valve. And you can apply Bernoulli's equation and you won't have a pressure gain. What will you have? you'll have a pressure loss. So G-A-I-N or loss. And so when you have Bernoulli's equation applied to a ductor pipe, first of all, you'll find that a lot of people will put this alpha term in front of the kinetic energy term. That's our kinetic energy correction factor. And then if they have a gain, they'll put it on the left-hand side as a positive gain or if they have a loss, they'll put it on the right-hand side with a positive loss. So if there's like a vacuum in the pipe, then a valve would cause pressure gain? No. Um, these are just devices where you have gains or losses. Don't make it too complex. Think about a pump or a turbine or some mechanical device that either puts energy in or extracts energy out. And then, a or a device that just loses energy because of friction through the valve. Partially closed valve is going to, you're just going to get some loss. You can still use the conservation of energy equation as long as you account for the energy loss. Okay. So you can have what I call modified Bernoulli equation with either talking about pressure, energy per unit mass, or head. We have all three forms. If you're talking about pressure, you have a pressure gain or a pressure loss. If you're talking about head, you have a head gain or a head loss. 
Notice all you're doing is different units for the same concept. The energy per unit something. Energy per unit volume, energy per unit mass, energy per unit weight of the fluid. But you will see that often. Or just, I like to use a different symbol for energy per unit mass than a symbol for, than the same symbol than energy per unit uh, weight. I like to use cap H instead of lowercase h. Okay, so head gain or head loss. Now you're ready to solve some problems, aren't you? We have a hydraulic turbine. It's used to generate electricity. What flows through a hydraulic turbine? Water, and it always stays in the liquid phase. Water flows at 3.4 cubic meters per second through a 0.4 meter diameter pipe uh, for an inlet that is 80 meters higher than the outlet. So you have uh, the inlet to the pipe, comes down, you have some device called the hydraulic turbine, you had the exit to the pipe, and they're saying that this dif difference right here is 80 meters. The diameter is equal to uh, 0.4 meters. And the volumetric flow rate, AV, or Q, is equal to 3.4 meters cubed per second. That's the flow rate flowing through the system. The frictional head loss through the pipe is 6 meters. First time you see that, you say, okay, they're giving me some sort of head loss, but they're giving it to me in units of 6 meters? Is that a typo? I would say lowercase hl is equal to 6 meters. I would go back to my modified Bernoulli equation, and I would say they're talking about head, energy per unit weight. The head loss is given in this statement to be 6 meters. See that? So let's continue to read. Determine the power that is transferred from the water. So the water's flowing through. There's being transferred out of the water to something. It's going somewhere. It's going to the turbine, right? OK. Um, let me do this. Let me continue to read a little bit. What does the turbine do? Well, the turbine has an efficiency of 85% determine the shaft power developed by the turbine. So it's like this turns a shaft that comes out and you can have the W dot shaft power coming out of the turbine, okay? And then if you continue to read, the problem says the turbine drives an electric generator, and it has 93% efficiency, determined electric power, plus minus electricity, W dot electric that comes out of the generator. So we're thinking about the efficiency of the generator to be 93%, the efficiency of the turbine to be um, um, 85%, and you do have a head loss in, uh, through the pipe of 6 meters. There's head loss in the piping system. Maybe it's a bend in the pipe or a valve in the pipe that's partially open or partially closed, right? So all of those are to take into account. So let's solve this problem step by step. What is the power that is transferred from the water? What symbol do you want to use for what we're going to calculate? We need to calculate this. What is it? W dot. W dot. Now we have to be a little careful on this one because it's right here is W dot shaft. That's the shaft power that comes out of the turbine. We're just trying to get the power that's coming out of the fluid. If it comes out of the fluid, it's going into this device that's going to convert it into shaft power called the turbine. Not 100% of what comes out of the fluid is converted into the shaft power. Only 85% is. So what symbol do you want to use for the power that is transferred from the water. W dot F, then some of it would be converted to W dot shaft, and then some of it would be converted to W dot electric. But there's really a difference between what is coming out of the fluid, 
Or if you turned it around, what went into the fluid? Let's say I have a water pump. And there I would be supplying shaft power to the pump but trying to get as much of that into the fluid. And what the well, electric motor is going to be, you know, drawing electric power. So this is kind of a pump application. This is a turbine application, just the reverse. So let's use W dot F. But we have to be clear, what is W dot F? It's some power, but it's what's, in this case, coming out of the fluid. How am I going to calculate W dot F? Yeah, let's apply Bernoulli's from here all the way down to there because that's where they give us the elevation difference and they give us the total head loss. So let's make some calculations. Yes, sir. Can you multiply the head loss in meters times rho g and then like treat it like pressure? Let's go ahead and write down the Bernoulli equation and let's do it for head, H-E-A-D. And then if I want to change it to pressure, I can multiply head times rho g, then I get pressure, okay. But if I have head, what do I have? I have uh, the pressure at one, here's state one, inlet, and then two, pressure at one divided by rho g plus v1 squared divided by 2g plus, well, with an alpha one, put an alpha one there. We're going to be correct on the, we just learned kinetic energy correction factor, although guess what I'm going to do? No information given, alpha is equal to one. Boom. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now let's continue on. We're going to have uh, G, not GZ, just uh, Z1 plus any gains. Do we have any gains? Do we have any head gain? No, we don't have any head gain, but I'll put it in and we'll know that's zero. P2 divided by rho g plus alpha 2 V2 squared divided by 2g plus Z2 plus HL. Okay, there's one more term I need to stick into here. The head change because it's coming out of the fluid. Okay. And so this head loss is due to friction. Look up here. Uh, the frictional head loss. That's not associated with the turbine extracting fluid energy out of the flowing stream. So what we have to do is we have to put another term. Let me scoot this over because I don't have enough room. Scoot it over a little bit. And we're going to put here... Uh, a uh, plus the head change of the fluid that's now being taken out of the fluid and converted into transferred into the uh, into the turbine. Okay, let's get rid of our zero terms. So up here at one, we don't have anything about the pressure at one and two. You can think about those being atmospheric pressure. What really drives it is the elevation change of the water. Okay, now what about the difference in the pipe diameter? Well, the alpha 1 and the alpha 2 are both going to be 1. What about the velocity 1 and the velocity 2? Did the inlet velocity change from the outlet velocity? It's a constant diameter in the same flow rate. It's, we're, it's water, so we're going to treat it incompressible. Guess what? Yeah. And now, we're not having any head gains. Actually, we're having a head extraction because of the turbine, it's, but it's coming out of the fluid. Okay, so what we have is we have this equation for the head uh, coming uh, transfer out of the t fluid that's going into the turbine is equal to the high elevation minus the low elevation minus any head loss. So the head loss, the frictional head loss, does not help us. <laughs> it only sort of robs the potential to make more power out of this hydraulic turbine. Let's, let's go ahead and take a look at our numbers. It's, uh, what is the elevation change? 80 meters. So we have 80 minus 6, so that will be um, 
uh, 74 meters. So it's like the elevation would be if the head's off a little bit. That's right. We could have gotten 80, but because we had pipes and a little frictional loss in there, we get 74. This is the energy per unit weight. What the, where does that energy go? Out of the fluid and into the turbine. Okay? So how do I calculate that power that is transferred from the water? I've got the energy per unit weight out of the water, but I want to calculate W dot out of the water. How am I going to do that? Well, if I took H of F, which is energy per unit weight, and I multiplied by weight per unit time, would I have the right? Yeah. So, okay, well, what is the weight? It will be the, it'll be the volume per unit time times the weight per unit volume. What's my volume per unit time? Volumetric flow rate. What's my weight per unit volume? Is it gamma? Yes or no? Professor, I'm just going to watch you solve the problem. Isn't that it? Yeah, it's rho g. Isn't that our weight density? Mm hmm. Yeah. It's so here what I got to do is I have to say this was calculated to be 74 meters. Oh, I just covered up my flow rate. Let me see if I have it on paper here. Nope, don't have it. I have to back up. Sorry about that. Okay. The flow rate 3.4 meters cubed per second. 3.4 meters cubed per second. And then what is for water? What is the gamma 9.81 kilonewtons per meter cubed how many people agree one person two three four let's take a look let's work with the units so meters cubed go, we have a meter times a kilonewton is a kilojoule. You multiply or divide by second, that's a kilowatt. So whatever kilowatts, W dot fluid kilowatts. Make sense? All right, I'm, I'm sorry I've scrolled down on this page. Let me scroll back up. That's how you would calculate the answer for this part. What about... If the turbine has efficiency of 85%, determine the shaft power developed by the turbine. You multiply by 0.85, and then you would get W dot shaft is um, point, or the efficiency, let's put that, if eta of the turbine times W dot F. And then the turbine drives the electric generator, has efficiency, eta of the electric generator is 93%, determine the electric power generated. Isn't that just uh, times W dot shaft gives W dot electric? And so you're going to get less and less and less. It's, it's not more kilowatts. It's fewer kilowatts that progress through the system because of the friction and losses. All right. Okay. Three meter high water tank is initially filled with water. Uh, the tank water surface is open to the atmosphere so it's not pressurized. And a sharp edge to 10 centimeter diameter orifice at the bottom drains to the atmosphere through a horizontal 80 meter long pipe. Wow, that's a long pipe, 80 meters long. If the uh, total irreversible head loss of the system is determined to be 1.5 meters. What did they just give us? HL is 1.5 meters. Is it PL? No. Is it cap HL? No. This is a lowercase HL. It's energy per unit weight. This would have been energy per unit mass. This would have been energy per unit volume.
but we know what we're dealing with. We're dealing with some irreversible head loss due to the friction in the long run of this pipe. Determine the initial velocity of the water from the tank. Well, as the water level drops, what's the velocity going to do? Yeah, it'll go down. So, so they want it when the height of the water in the tank is three meters. That's what they mean by the initial velocity. The t discharge, disregard the effect of kinetic energy correction factor. <laughs> Alpha equal one. <laughs> okay. Velocity, but, of zero, velocity of a large diameter tank, you are going to assume it's zero. So we do the Bernoulli from here all the way to there. When we do that, we'll think about state one, exit state two, and we really want to get V2. That's that velocity of the water from the tank. Okay. It's the same. Isn't the diameter of the pipe 10 centimeters and the diameter of the hole coming out of the tank into the pipe 10 centimeters? So it's, it's only one diameter. It's not like they're trying to trick us with two diameters or make it more difficult with two diameters. So we would say, go slow, write Bernoulli every turn. We could have pressure gain or head gain, and we could have head loss, et cetera. So what do we have? Let me try and write it here. Um, P1 divided by rho g plus V1 squared divided by 2g with the alpha 1 plus um, the uh, uh, z1 uh, plus uh, lowercase h gain equal to P2 divided by rho g plus alpha 2 V2 squared divided by 2g plus z2 plus HL. I think that's enough for this problem. The inlet and outlet pressures are atmospheric. The inlet velocity negligible. This alpha is equal to 1, just like that alpha was equal to 1. And we have no head gains. There's no pump. We just have a head loss, which is given. So we find the equation that V2 uh, is equal to uh, Z1 minus Z2 um, 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 minus HL, all of that times uh, 2G square root. So the head loss has a not a good effect. It'll reduce the flow, <laughs> right? Uh, what makes the flow? Well, the difference in the head that drives it to the high elevation of the surface water in the tank compared to the discharge. Okay, so I think... Nope. No, this is... This HL right here, this, this is primarily in the small diameter. The, they just tell us it's just given a given amount. All right, so the problem gives us uh, what is our uh, elevation difference? Three meters minus the 1.5 meters, quite a bit is lost <laughs> through friction, times 2 times g. Now here we'll put 9.81 meters per second squared, and these units are meters, so we'll get when we take the square root meters per second. So there you go. Five point four two five meters per second. Look good. So with that, we'll go ahead and stop for today. Thank you.